The main type of step politics was simple enough. When one of the tribes became too strong, the other tribes were united against it. The variety of unions was explained by a large number of interclan relations. Unity or dissension of clans in the same tribe as well as friendship or rivalry of leaders. Transitions of his army were not measured in kilometers, but in degrees of latitude and longitude. The whole Christian world quaked of one name, Genghis Khan, and Muslims were convinced that all his actions were actions of a supernatural creature. Rustan Rahman Aliyev the Turks' empire, great civilization. Creation of Genghis Khan's state When a turning period came into political life of the Turk Mongols, when the history made its historical challenge, Heaven and the earth agreed and determined him, Genghis Khan, marked by the seal of heavenly origin, to be the only legitimate ruler of the world, king of kings, sovereign by the grace of God. The idea of Genghis Khan's heavenly mandate for the reign of the global empire became the official ideology of Genghis Khan's state. The ideological doctrine proclaimed the inviolability of power of Genghis Khan and Genghis Eats over the Okumeni and the Mongols' leading role over all other peoples. The source of political power of the Golden Clan members is genealogy, namely, their belonging to Genghis Khan's direct descendants through parental lineage. The exclusive right to the kingdom is recognized only for Genghis Khan's first four sons from his elder wife Borte. Juchi, Chagatai, Ugidei, and Tolu, and their direct descendants, who constituted the Golden Clan, the ruling Mongol dynasty. Since the Kuril Tai of 1206, Genghis Khan consistently created the real state, and in this affair he relied on his basic principles – division of people into mean, selfish, coward, and on the contrary, honest, true, brave people who put their honor and dignity above safety and material well-being. Special respect for nomads, who surpass settled peoples morally and ethically. Devout religiosity of everyone, from the great Khan to the last warrior. Genghis Khan believed that such religiosity was an indispensable condition of the psychological pattern that he valued in his subordinates. The state must rely not on religious ideology, but on the national Turkic-Mongol principle. Only such a principle could stimulate spiritually uplifting values of the Turks and Mongols. Absence of dogmatism and religious tolerance in relation to Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, etc. The Mongols and Turks only kept aloof from people of Jewish religion. They freed clergy of all religions from duties but they continued to take taxes from rabbis. There was no official state religion during Genghis Khan's reign. Among his warriors, commanders and administrators there were Tengrians, Buddhists, Muslims and Christians. One Arab merchant, who knew 12 languages, was well read, came to Kagan, and all historians stood near him and wrote down. He knew everything, traveled round the world, came up and put a question. Why do you always make a war? Kagan turned to him and said, I build a state. That Arab, and he read Aristotle, read about building the state properly, thought. What does he know? Something like that. He asked Kagan, what do you know about this state? 
How do you understand it? Kagan answered, and it was written. When a five-year-old boy leaves Hungary alone, goes to visit China and comes back alone, this is a state. That's what they provided. At least 150 years ago, it was like that. Sober mind, full of common sense, remarkably balanced, able to listen, reliable in friendship, magnanimous and kind-hearted, despite his strictness, possessing excellent qualities of a leader. René Grousset According to Genghis Khan, the ruler's power should be based not on any ruling class, not on any particular official religion, but on a certain psychological type of people. Such people heavenly believed that only the laws of Yassa would help to create a state and restore order. So they proclaimed Genghis Khan as the supreme ruler and carried the whole people with them. And the people understood that with proper observance of laws, without violating them, they could live peacefully. By the way, Genghis Khan, from the beginning of his reign, relied on a hundred faithful supporters, with whom he subsequently created the great Turkic Mongol Empire, which, unlike states formed by nomads, survived for centuries. Organizational reforms established a new order in the nomads' life, despite the fact that government intervention in the rights of leaders of tribes and clans, subordination of the aristocracy to orders, division of the people into military units and the introduction of compulsory military service contradicted with traditions of nomadic steppe people and their way of life. The interval between the victory over the Naimans 1204 and the campaign against the Tanguts 1209 became the only period in Genghis Khan's life when solution of organizational tasks, but not wars, came to the foreground. At that time, he laid foundations of the internal structure of the empire. He dealt with strengthening the power of the ruling house, and Genghis Khan entrusted to his commanders to conduct military operations. Although one exception was made, in 1206, after the great cruelty ended, Genghis Khan marched against Buyruk Khan, who at one moment sheltered Kuchluk, Tayan Khan's son, and Toktoa Baki, Merkit's leader. All Timujin's activities reflected the interests of his noyons. In an effort to secure their full support, he established a kind of courtyard with a large staff of court ranks appointed from the noyons of different clans and tribes. So there were heads of Khan's herds of horses, Khan's herds of cattle, Khan's wagons, royal covers, bearers of Khan's chair, and so on. Temujin legalized institution of Darkhans, persons who for special merits were freed from all fines and duties and also from punishment for nine most serious misdemeanors. Timujin, by force of arms, struggled for internal strengthening of his Zulus, striving for termination of unauthorized decampments of persons and groups who didn't want to obey him. These measures were not accidental. His power was far from being strengthened. Sources report that preparing for the campaign, he had to detach special troops and commanders, especially loyal to him, in the rear guard to be safe from behind Mongol, Kirait, Naiman tribes and others who were mainly conquered. But it will not happen that again, some of scattered tribes will once again gang up and plan to resist. I'll give an example. They sat and voted what tax should be. They had seized a huge empire, they sat in Karakarum, and it was necessary to decide what the tax would be. One proposed a poll tax by the number of people. Another 
offered a tax by the number of smokes. The third proposed a tax by housing, livestock, etc., how to collect it from all peoples and everything else. Il Luci Sai, Chinese foreign minister, proposed his own version. Ugi Dei, who was elected to Kagan after Genghis Khan, said very interesting words. The tax will be 10%. Everyone said, this is not enough. He said, it's enough. If we make a tax of 11-12%, people will hide money in their pockets. Then we will need to get the tax police, informers, etc., to take the hidden. These apparatus will expand, it will work for itself, not for the state, not for us. And everybody will give 10%. And so they paid these 10%, as Kudrin said, we lived under the Tatars and paid a tenth. 90% remained with him, and what he does with them, we don't care. At these 10%, the army was maintained the best army in the world. It turns out that nothing else was needed, and as a result everyone grew rich greatly. All the famous white stone Kremlins were built, and Sabel and Tsar Kenan were cast when the Mongols stood there. It was the same in China. The Yuan dynasty was the most highly developed in philosophy, culture and architecture. It was in the golden period. And earlier, when Hulagids ruled, the tax was also of 10%. Italian masters from Milan, Genova, came to Sarajburke, worked and also paid 10%. Genghis Khan appeared before us as embodiment of a step warrior with his instincts of gain and robbery. Only his extraordinary willpower allowed Genghis Khan to restrain his instincts, to mortify them for the sake of achieving higher goals. Boris Vladimirtsev Genghis Khan, with his phenomenal skill and knowledge of people, chose his assistants and appointed them to different positions. His genius especially vividly manifested in this. Therefore, demanding much from his subordinates, he always cared very much for his personal acquaintances. For example, sending Subede Bagadur with the troop to pursue Mirki Toktoa's children, Genghis Khan gave him such instruction. Whoever disobey orders, bring him here if I know him. If not, execute him in that place. Genghis Khan. All the Mongol troops, and therefore all the Mongols, according to the old steppe custom, were divided by Genghis into three parts. The center, Kel, the middle army headed by Naya, troops of the left, eastern side, Dunga, led by Mukali, and troops of the right, western side, Barungar, commanded by Bogurchi. I release you from punishment for nine crimes, Genghis Khan said to Bogurchi, appointing him commander of the right wing. Be the emir, commander of 10,000 warriors, and rule this western country up to the Golden Mountains, Altai. Be the emir of the left hand, he said to Mukali at the same time, and rule the eastern side up to the Karaun Mountains. Your descendants will be inherited in this dignity. Чингис Хан, независимо от э, принципов престола наследования по, по коллатеральной линии, передать... In the Mongol period, in my opinion, revolutionary thing happened that Genghis Khan managed, independently of the principles of succession to the throne, to transfer his possessions through the collateral line, to divide them among his sons. And nobody impeded it. According to Barfield, it was also a crisis, transition from one inheritance principle to another. In addition, it was discussed by the society, and this society couldn't perceive it as a necessity, that is, it would hold to some traditions and inhibit this. I probably adhere to the idea of transition from maternal legal relations, where were collateral relations between brothers and sisters and tribal relations. But they did nominate a leader as the main participant in all political events who would be powerless in the maternal legal relations, and on the contrary, they nominated a leader as a central link. 
a link that would unite all, that would already carry sacralization. All features of charisma in these terms, sulde, kut, fun, and that would carry the right of inheritance, that is, affirmation of paternal legal relations. In my opinion, the crisis was associated with this transition. Moreover, this transition didn't occur immediately in the Kun period or in the Turkic period, and it didn't become Mongolian at once. It was also reflected in the Kazakh Khanate, in the Jungar Khanate, that is, it happened periodically. No Yans of a two men, ten thousand warriors, a thousand and a hundred, coming to listen to our thoughts at the beginning and end of the year and going back can command the army. The condition of those who do not hear our thoughts in their youths is like a stone fallen into large water or like an arrow launched into a reed place. Such people do not have to command. Genghis Khan Having organized such a steppe aristocracy, Genghis Khan also took care of arranging civil administration. And perhaps, for Genghis, it was more difficult to set up it than military one. Genghis Khan himself could never read and write, and he didn't know any other language, except his native Mongolian. Apparently, Genghis became acquainted with reading and writing only after victory over the Naimans, when the Mongols captured Uyghur Tatatunga, who was in the surface of Tayang Khan and was his custodian of the stamp. This Tatatunga became the first teacher of the Mongols. Genghis Khan himself never learned to read and write, but with his usual foresight, he immediately appraised its great significance, and first of all for the needs of the state created by him. That's why Genghis ordered his relatives and other supporters to learn to read and write. Genghis's stepbrother, Shagi Kutuku, achieved particularly rapid progress in this matter, and in general, apparently, he proved to be the most flexible for perception of foreign Uyghur education and culture. Genghis therefore appointed him chief judge, giving him such a specific resolution. Now that I've just consolidated all nations, be my ears and eyes. No one will oppose what you say. I entrust you to judge and punish in cases of theft and deception. Whoever will deserve to die, put him to death. Whoever will deserve punishment, impose a penalty from him. Decide cases on division of people's property write the decided cases on black plates so that others will not change after that. Genghis Khan Having completed arrangement of military and civil administration, Genghis Khan established the position of Beki, desiring to have a state chief priest vested with authority and recognized officially. This title or rank of Beki was known since olden times, and it was often borne by leaders of separate clans and tribes, mostly forced ones who combined secular power of the prince and spiritual authority of the sorcerer associated with the former progenitor and familiar spirits. Genghis then established the position of such a state sorcerer and appointed old man Usun the Beki. Usun, Genghis Khan said to him, you are Barin's senior descendant. You should be Beki. When you'll be Beki, ride a white horse, put on white clothes and sit on the top in society. Choose a good year and the moon.
Genghis Khan could reward the most loyal supporters. He was beholden to them for helping him to ascend to the heights of power. They were Jelme, Subete, Hubilai, Jebe, Bogurchi, Munlik, and Kunan, or Dege. The Khan valued highly their bravery and loyalty shown during military campaigns. He also rewarded his family members. His four sons, Tului, Ugede, Juchi, and Chagatai, as well as the adopted children, Shigi Kutuku, his sworn brother Borogul, and Guchu. The chronicle emphasizes that he remembered all those people who had died serving him faithfully and loyally. Genghis Khan provided various privileges to children of his warriors who had died on battlefields. His generosity can be judged by his deeds. Genghis Khan was able to forgive his enemies. Jamuha often betrayed him, but each time Genghis Khan forgave him. And only at Jamuha's own request, Genghis Khan executed him without spilling blood. This also wasn't easy for him. He had to overcome some kind of core inside himself. The fact that he recruited worthy, brave, valiant, courageous and talented people indicates his far-reaching plans. But he evaluated people according to the qualities that he himself had. He saw good points in people, he saw in people those qualities that he had himself. If he hadn't had these qualities, he wouldn't have been able to evaluate these, to select properly the cadre of officers, the staff of his military commanders. There is such a saying, remember, mediocrity gathers around himself mediocre people. Only ingenious, talented people who have pure thoughts and clear goals can collect those people who are needed to perform some task. Well, mediocrity always gathers around himself mediocre people. Along with barbaric and horrible feelings, we undoubtedly find in him high and noble sides, through which he takes his place among humanity. René Grousset Mongol tribes were united, nomadic peoples of Central Asia were conquered, and Genghis Khan's power strengthened. The main task of that period for the new emperor was strengthening his army and administration. He obtained the mandate for that by the mere fact of his election. Now he received absolute authority, and the Kurultai, which was founded as a constitutional assembly, became the organ of imperial advisors who assisted the ruler in implementing necessary reforms. The clan principle was violated immediately and consciously. The commanders received the rank by merits and not by birth. In such militant people, consisting of different tribes, it was necessary to maintain a strict order, for which a real force was always required. Genghis Khan foresaw this, and from among the most loyal warriors he created, as the instrument of power, a leading detachment, a guard which in the future would be utterly devoted to the ruler and would fulfill his will, whatever it might be. From the people of long will there was created a military elite, which cannot be called either an aristocracy, an oligarchy or a democracy since it was a horde of the ancient Turkic Kaganate, but expanded into the whole great steppe and assimilated tribes. In 1207, Genghis Khan continued his conquests and acted almost exclusively with the help of his military commanders. So he sent his eldest son Juchi with troops of the right side against the forest peoples, Oirats and Kyrgyzes, peoples no longer of Mongol origin, who lived along the Yenisei. 
Conquering these places, Genghis Khan wanted to protect himself from sudden attacks and also to take into his hands the trade routes to the Yenisei, where at that time a lot of grain was sowed, which was exported with the assistance of Muslim and Uyghur merchants to Mongolia. In addition, the country of forest peoples was rich in sables and other furs. From there, hunting falcons were brought. Juchi very successfully fulfilled his father's assignment. After the brilliant victory, the Kyrgyzes submitted to Genghis Khan. In 1207, they sent him ambassadors with magnificent white falcons as a sign of their admiration for his power and an oath of the allegiance. The following year, the Oirats followed the lead of the Kyrgyzes. Genghis Khan's glory and authority spread throughout Central Asia. Information about his ascent to power and his military successes reached Uyghur state Kocho. The Uyghurs recognized Genghis Khan's power over them. This became a political event of great importance and had serious consequences. From a military viewpoint, conquest of the Uyghurs released the Mongols from the need to strengthen the southwestern wing of their empire. On the he forbade to plunder and exterminate those tribes and towns that became part of the Mongol possessions voluntarily. East Turkestan, Uyghur, Idikut, Balasagun and other tribes and towns became part of the Mongol Empire voluntarily, practically without a fight. And that's why historians often say Genghis Khan conquered southern Kazakhstan and Central Asia. But why southern? Because Semirechi and East Turkestan were included in the Mongol Empire on a voluntary basis. He was interested in beliefs of the conquered peoples, without giving preference to ones or the others, considering that all moral rules were good. There was no rule that should be preferred to others. Such were the roots of his success and greatness. Never a single man reached such a degree of power and felt less pride from it. Louis Ambi There were appointed special courtyard officials who provided food for both the imperial family and the gods. Somewhat later, the imperial family members were granted allotments of land. Unlike feudal Europe, the allotments consisted not of land holdings, but of isolated groups of people with the relevant herds. So, Genghis Khan's mother, Uelun, with Ochigin, that is, Yesuge's youngest brother, received 10,000 youths and therefore farms or families. The parts allocated for Genghis Khan's four sons were distributed according to seniority. The eldest, Juchi, received 9,000 youths. Chagatai received 8,000. Ugide and Tului, each of 5,000 youths. Among Genghis Khan's brothers, Khazar received 4,000 youths. Belgute, one and a half thousand. His nephew Alchi Te was gifted 2,000 yurts. Allotments were subject to control by the emperor, and accordingly Genghis Khan appointed several noyons as advisors to each of their recipients. Tranquility and order should have prevailed both in the family and in clans. The draconian laws were enacted to put an end to plundering inroads and blood revenge. Thus, the imperial family, as an institution, became part of the imperial system. The camp, horde, of every member of the imperial house became part of the power subordinated to the great Khan. Next, in turn, was the military reform. But about this you will know in the next episodes.